sir <clears throat> myself dr kavardeep very good morning good evening to all of you so today i am here to talk about viral disease and in particular lumpy skin disease and uh, you know this particular disease has recently caused a big havoc in the livestock industry but before we start this we all should know that uh, there are many viral diseases that affect livestock and some of them have been known for their uh, you know known for be uh, there being there in centuries like uh, foot and mouth disease while some are relatively new one like this lumpy skin disease or the bovine bsc which is called as bovine uh, spongiform encephalitis in general majority of these viral diseases that affect livestock have a worldwide distribution throughout the world they are they are affecting the livestock population some have produces produced tremendous losses to the livestock production severe mortality live, reproductive failures significant decrease in milk and uh, meat production and because of their relative importance the viral disease you know and their control has been has put all the you know livestock owners and the government associated with it at a halt you know and they have put them into the condition where it has been uh, it has become necessary that certain diseases which are of viral origin need to be notified to the organizations of animal health so that they can be controlled but before we start all this we start with basic thing that what is virus virus why is virus able to cause such a big uh, havoc and why is virus different from other microorganisms like bacteria fungi rickettsia organisms basically you know virus virus itself is a non cellular infectious agent which is able to cause which is made up of genetic elements of the genetic element and which uses the body of the host body of the host or a livestock to replicate outside the um, body it is basically nothing it is called it's like a dead cell you know and a complete virus which is outside the living host or which is outside a living cell is called as a viron this viron is a complete infectious virus particle you understand what do you mean by complete infectious virus particle that means it is able to cause a disease by itself once it gets the opportunity you know you can call virus very opportunistic you know they take the opportunity the as soon as they come in you know contact with the living cell they take the opportunity they try to use the uh, machinery of the host and they replicate so a single viron it has it is rich in the genetic material to cause infection and is capable portable or has the potential to cause disease in a living animal now virus these two uh, there, there's a long history but i did not want to go into the history but i've just mentioned two pe uh, two people one is this dmitry ivanovsky he was the first russian botanist who discovered virology he's also called as the founder of virology and bejenik what is why i've mentioned this because he has led a landmark his landmark why it is called a landmark because he discovered a property of virus which is its filtrability it has been very recently that this property has you know has been broken otherwise earlier it was the condition was filtration was a property which could which was a sure shot thing for viral virus certain property of virus among the you know, properties of virus these properties of virus filtrable agent you know virus is only so small virus is so so small that normally that it pass it can pass through all the filters it is interesting that when you know when fmd was discovered and the spenderman when he discovered tobacco mosaic virus they were able to cause disease in the living host either plant or animal in from the filtrate itself 
so they were able to find that the filter the filters were not able to withhold all the uh, this you know were not able to withhold the virus as in comparison to bacteria fungi and they they are large agents the filters uh, they they do not pass through the filters so they are easily uh, they can be easily sieved out but virus cannot and this 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 filterable property of virus has been recently you know been uh, certain virus new viruses like uh, mimi virus and uh, the mega virus they have been discovered and these viruses they are big viruses so they are retained in the filters earlier these viruses were not were filtered by through the filters and even big viruses like the small smallpox virus which is considered a relatively bigger size virus and the smallest virus which is the polio virus it was they all were filtered through or through the, the filters and were found in the filtrate in high quantity the second property of viruses that is ultra microscopic the virus are really very small very small in size you know normally we are able to see the bacteria only under the microscope so virus are so small that we cannot see virus even under a bacteria uh, even under a microscope to visualize a bacteria or bacteria we need uh, you know 100 uh, um, uh, x magnification but to visualize a virus we need special instruments either a electron microscope or a super resolution microscope the size of virus is much more smaller than bacteria 100 nanometer whereas you know in the that is so less that you you really need high resolution instruments for visualizing a virus third property third property of virus which we call is they are do not possess any uh, cellular organelles but before that i discuss that you know i i like to discuss this obligate intracellular par parasite you know what does obligate intracellular parasite means that this one property of virus which clearly meets the criteria that it is a virus when the virus is outside the body with, uh, of the host it is like a dead particle you know it is innate it does not it is not active it is not able to produce disease it is you know as soon as enter as soon as the virus virus particle enters the body of the host or it enters any living cell it becomes or it acts like a zombie you know it becomes active it starts using the machinery of the host and it starts surviving on the you know abilities of the host it start utilizing its machinery to survive itself we can say that all virus are obligate intracellular uh, organelles all virus are in, uh, obligate intracellular parasites but all obligate intracellular agents are not virus there are certain bacteria also which are obligate intracellular uh, pa uh, parasites so but if there is a virus it has to be obligate intracellular parasite so it has not been possible till date to grow virus in laboratory without a living media without a living media the uh, uh, sorry not living media living cell without a living cell the virus cannot be grown okay then cellular organelles the virus do not have any cellular organelles so they lack any you know complicated mitochondria golgi body endoplasmic reticulum all cellular organelles are absent in virus so as we say this they lack all cellular organelles we would say that the multiplication in this is normally by uh, you know multiplication would be very simple they would be a simple binary fission or budding off because they do not have any special machinery but no the process of multiplication in virus is very very complex the manipulation the you know the virus can be said as very intelligent they use or manipulate the host body 
the, the multiplication is as such that resembles an assembly, you know, it resembles an assembly like in which different parts of virus come together from different sites in host cell and form a new virus particle. You know, it appears as if it is a mechanized machine work going on where different parts will come together at different sites and they will form a new virus particle. <clears throat> either one more difference which is found in virus is that we, either virus can be, can have a DNA as the genetic material or RNA as the genetic material. Normally, we have DNA as the genetic material, but virus can either have DNA as the genetic material or RNA as the genetic material. Virus, I told you they are very small in size. This is relatively the variation in size, which can be around 0.02 micron to 0.3 microns. Okay, now internalized structure, the simplest part or the simplest way, that's what virus structure is. It consists of mainly two parts, three rather, nucleic acid, which is the core, which is responsible for causing the uh, infection, the capsid, which has many subparts, and the envelope. This envelope part is present in certain virus and it uh, is absent in some uh, certain virus. Now, the cis central core, it consists of nucleic acids, okay, and matrix proteins, certain enzymes, and it uh, these mass matrix proteins and enzymes may be found in most of the virus they are found, but may, may be absent in certain viruses. Now, this nucleic acid, I already told you, it can be either DNA or RNA, okay? This DNA or RNA could be single-stranded or double-stranded. Now, double-stranded, normally double-stranded is DNA virus and single-stranded is RNA virus, okay? Now, these can be segmented or unsegmented. The present or presence of nucleic acid may be in the form of segments or maybe in the form of uh, uh, in a whole chunk that is unsegmented, okay? The, mm, it may be present and, and in a linear manner or in a circular manner. So the nucleic acids, okay? The nucleic acid has a wide variation where it shows its presence. Now, the covering, as I told you, no? the covering or the capsid. Now, the capsid is an envelope. Okay, this capsid is a protein shell, okay? And this uh, shell is enclosing the genetic material. You know, it is kind of a protective coat on the genetic material. This consists of several oligomeric structures or subunits, which are made up of proteins and are called as capsomers. These are called as capsomers. Now these, the capsid, together with the nucleic acid is called as nucleocapsid. The capsid along with the nucleic acid. So the core protein, the core that is the nucleic acid and its core, the capsomers, they together form the nucleocapsid, okay? Now, the protective shell. Now, protective shell is, I told you, made up of the capsid. It has many identical protein subunits and this protect the genetic material and they are also involved in one more thing that is called as symmetrical organization. This symmetrical organization is responsible for giving a particular shape to the virus particle. And being uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the capsomers, they also bear the 50%, they are uh, bearing the 50% weight of the uh, whole viral particle. Now this, uh, capsid is further protected by envelopes. You know, this, this is capsid. Okay. This capsid is further protected by an envelope. This envelope may be present in certain and may be absent in certain cases. Now, this capsomer, I told you this encloses a protein coat. Okay. This protein, this capsomers are enclosing the DNA material in it or, or the RNA material, which could be single stranded, double stranded. Uh, could be of any type, okay? Now, based on this, uh, their 
arrangement of capsomers, they have been divided into three particular shapes, polyhedral, helical, and complex. And based on the envelope, they have been divided into enveloped and unique. Now the polyhedral, uh, first of all, the icosahedral. Icosahedral, it is a polyhedron, you know, there are 12 vertices. It has been written. There are 12 vertices, 20 faces, and two types of capsomers for icosahedron. Cap there are two types of isopers for icosahedron capsid. One is pentagonal and one is hexagonal. Normally, there are always 12 pentons, but the number of hexons will vary. Okay? Now, the genetic material which is enclosed in an icosahedron cap uh, capsid is relatively very less because it forms a closed structure, okay? So this kind of virus, this kind of virus, it encloses very few or very less amount of genetic material, okay? Now this lack of genetic material or this small structure is limited or seen in poliovirus, rhinovirus and adenovirus. The helical symmetry, you know, this, this helical symmetry, the protomers or the or the capsomers, they are you know not grouped as capsomers. They are bound to form a long ribbon-like structure, and these ribbon-like structure they fold in such a way to form a helix. And because these protomers are thicker at one end than the other, the diameter of the helical capsid is determined by the characteristics of the protomers. So while its length is determined by the length of the nucleic acid. So this form, this is a helical structure. The amount of nucleic acid which it uh, encloses is enormous. So huge amount of nucleic acid is placed. So they are not a closed structure. They are a helical structure which keeps on increasing in size. So tobacco mosaic virus, very common example. This of helical um, symmetry, this tobacco mosaic virus is a very common example of helical symmetry. Then comes the complex symmetry. Now, this group comprises of those viruses which do not fit either into the icosahedral uh, this uh, structure and the or the helical shape. It may have complex outer wall or head, uh, and the head and tail morphology would be very different. You know, this head tail morphology structures are unique to virus and especially those viruses which are infecting the bacteria. Certain viruses which are infecting the bacteria, this head tail morphology is so different and these bacteria which are infecting the bacteria, uh, these viruses which are infecting the bacteria are called as bacteriophage. The head of the virus, as it is shown in the picture, the head of the virus is icosahedral, whereas the, uh, the tail, it shows a helical structure, okay? Pox virus. When the viral particle has entered the host cell, the host cell enzyme digests the capsid and it constitutes of capsomers, thereby exposing the next gen genetic material of the virus to the host for its action, okay? In general, these capsomers, which are present in all, their function is to protect the virus against all physical, chemical, and enzymatic agents. That is why, and that is one of the one reasons that virus are not easily, you know, destroyed by physical and chemical agents. Then comes capsu capsomas are, they multiply, and uh, they are having a few proteus subunits that are repeated. So they are, you know, they keep on increasing the size of the virus. And it is mainly, mainly concerned, the capsomers are mainly concerned to introduce the enclosed viral genome into the host cell and absorbing it readily on the absorb, uh, this host surface. So you know, as soon as it attaches to the host cell, it is responsible for its attachment and sending the genetic material into the host cells. Now, the enveloped and non-enveloped virus. The enveloped virus have a covering and the non-enveloped virus lack the covering. So it could be of, you know, the example as the 
the um, it could be of any symmetry icosahedral helical the any virus could have an envelope and any virus could not have an envelope so enveloped and non enveloped virus for example this influenza virus and hepatitis c virus all of these viruses are enveloped virus okay now the main disease this lst now this lst del lst is a disease now that belongs to a group of uh, family pox viridae under the genus capsi uh, sorry capripox this genus capripox comprises of three main genuses sheep pox virus goat pox virus and the lumpy uh, skin disease virus okay this lumpy skin disease virus is also called as pseudo urticaria needling disease or uh, this uh, uh, nodularis bovis it has many name okay now lumpy was first discovered in zambia in the year 1929 and historically it was found out that it is restricted or it was endemic only in the areas of south african uh, southern and eastern africa in the year 1985 to 89 this disease occurred in various parts of uh, outside the sub saharan Af uh, this africa in egypt and in israel subsequently it the lst outbreaks were reported in many disease like uh, many areas of kuwait oman yemen uh, this uh, israel and west bank around 2000 2012 this outbreak there was an outbreak of lst in israel and this outbreak was considered very important because lst occurred in those animals which were already vaccinated with sheep pox strain till now still one of the vaccines what we are using is of sheep pox strain so the uh, on outbreak of this this uh, lst it was found that the sheep pox vaccine had a failure in uh, preventing the initial infection and spread of disease in the in year 2007 and 2012 in israel similarly in 2013 this report, the lst outbreaks were reported in turkey and jordan in 2014 it was reported in iran cyprus azerbaijan in 2015 various countries of greece in greece and southeastern europe countries many countries of southeastern europe reported that there were cases of uh, you know lst and there were there were huge mortality and uh, morbidity rates rather not mortality morbidity rates during uh, these uh, you know exposures now in india in india lst was first reported in 2019 okay and first reported to uh you know to the animal organizations office uh, you know episoticus in 2019 and this occurrence of this disease was in odisha and this uh, after the disease occurred the confirmation took almost 3 months so in august it was found that there is something like lumpy the, the, there was certain uh, the animals were showing showing symptoms like lumpy skin disease and those uh, symptoms were confirmed in 2019 uh, in uh, november uh, november 2019 and there was a massive outbreak in 2012 and this outbreak in 2012 it started in april from in gujarat and it spread over to all over the country and i think many states many state had had to incur huge losses especially the northern parts this lumpy caused a huge havoc huge havoc because the animals suffered a lot because of this now the lumpy the disease transmission of this you know the disease is normally you know what is the main cause of the disease is you know mechanically this disease is caused by biting orthopods 
to you know arthropod vectors like mosquitoes ticks biting flies coleicoids and uh, you know during this recent uh, uh, lumpy skin havoc we had a lab set up in our college and we were able to isolate uh, lumpy skin virus uh, the lst virus uh, from musca which is not a biting arthropod you know the common domestic fly and this paper has to be published and uh, you know this was our uh, work and we found out that uh, even musca was able to transmit the disease so the transmission of the disease by so many sources made this transmission so easy and made this trans uh, transmission you know uh, very seasonal because uh, these uh, orthopods or these vectors you know they predominate in certain season so predominance of these uh, vectors during the season also led to an conclusion that uh, the orthopods were the main vectors which are you know which were transmitting this disease to other animals now the transmission cycle so lst infected animals they are affected you know the lst transmission can be done uh, can occur due to vector transmission or non vector transmission now vector transmission is um, we are uh, any uh, you know um, what you call as the orthopods biting flies midges mosquitoes mites and even i told you musca which we discovered in our lab musca is you know anything which comes uh, across uh, this or uh, it is comes from any infected animal in in a dead uh, in a vehicle in uh, formites uh in uh, any kind of equipment this may come to a infected animal and come fruit and that infected animal may transfer it to the other animal and in non vector transmission now these carriers this musca biting fly they carry the infection to other animals by sitting on them by biting on them so they are the source of carrying information okay now non vector transmission either direct transmission or indirect transmission now direct transmission is through bodily secretions we know that vector uh, this disease or this virus is shed into all the secretions oral nasal ocular milk and semen theek hai all secretions are are shedding the virus and when the animals come in contact with each other they share the common feeding troughs they share the common drinking uh, you know troughs or uh, they are coming in direct contact with each other they are licking each other or something like that that leads to transmission even a mother which is affected by infected uh, with lst in the newborn calf this disease comes through maternal uh, you know intrauterine transfer so direct transfer for Through ocular, uh, through the bodily secretions, or through the mother to the young one, indirect secretion by infected anything which is infected, the needles, syringes, buckets, the clothes, the man which is uh, you know catering to the uh, infected animal, it may formites anything that can carry the virus because virus is being continuously shed. Anything which has been uh, the carrying the virus can in the can affect a healthy animal now this lst it has a lot of you know um, variation age variation you know it has been found that below one year below one year it is able to cause very less disease around about 5.8 to 5.5 percent 5.4% you know very uh, um, uh, uh, low amount of disease is caused whereas in case of adult and sorry in case of uh, um, animals which are below 1 year it causes only 1 to 3 percent of the disease whereas in case of uh, animals which are between 1 to 5 years you know this disease is caused at a very high le- level round about 58% of the disease is caused because of it 
and above five years, it is around about 6% of the diseases cost. So the variation is that the productive group, when the animal is at its peak productivity, this disease is affecting the animal and it's affecting its productive abil uh, you know, ability of the animal. Now, below one year, it has been seen that below one year, the severity of disease is very high. The severity of disease is very high and the animal uh, tend to show more mortality rate at below one year. Above one year, that is one to five years, it has high morbidity rate, not mortality rate, okay? Now, host range of LSD. LSD is very, very specific. It is mainly caused in cattle and buffalo. And in that also, it only affects cattle more and less in buffalo. The buffalo, especially what we, when we were very working on LSD, what we came across, the buffalo were found to be quite resistant to, to LSD, you know. Our area buffalo were found to be quite resistant to LSD. They did not show much signs for this. And even if infected, they were not, their production and their, uh, you know, the pustules and all things were not so severe, okay? But in cattle, the mortality, uh, this morbidity was very high, okay? Morbidity was very high and it uh, high, uh, you know, pustules, the animal were very, very significant signs were shown in cattle. And susceptibility also. The boss taurus and boss indicus. You know, boss taurus. Uh, bo the boss taurus is the species which are European cattle. And boss indicus is the Indian cattle. So European cattle are more prone to uh, LST in comparison to the Indian cattle. Okay. So the Indian cattle is comparatively resistant to LST in comparison to the European cattle. And crossbreds. Crossbreds, I'll, I'll show you. The crossbreds are more, uh, you know, susceptible to uh, LST in comparison to uh, um, Brosterus or Bosindicus, any of them, because uh, it has been found that uh, in, uh, all the crossbred animals showed significant signs, significant signs of this disease when they were when they were subjected or when they came across this disease okay now morbidity and mortality of this disease morbidity was widely variable you know morbidity was around about 3% to 85% there were there is uh, uh, what you call inherent ability of certain animals they were able to resist and there is uh, you know um, you know very very uh, wide range of signs and symptoms Certain animals did show very extreme signs and symptoms and certain animals were able to, you know, um, uh, show certain signs and they were able to recover very fast. Okay. Mortality was very low, one to three percent. Okay. Mortality was very low. And in case the mortality was high, it was high in animals which were below one to three years. And that is maybe the small and small animals were not able to combat with the mortar, this, you know, the viral load. So the mortality was uh, very low in journal, but at times, you know, it could be, it could have risen to 20%, 20 to 85%. Uh, but uh, in our area, when we were doing this, it was very low rather than I think 2%, even less than that. Okay, the mortality was very low. Morbidity was so high. Now the pathogenesis of the disease. Now the pathogenesis of the virus is transmitted mechanically by biting orthopods. And this transmission of LST, uh, you know, these this leads to, uh, after biting the orthopod bites, this leads to rapid increase in the leukocyte count. And leukocyte count, we mean by what we mean by leukocyte count is that there is increase in WBC level in the body. And uh, you know, when whenever any pathogen enters in the body, what will happen? The host or the you know the host will try to protect itself. The host will try to um, protect the um, protect itself from the pathogen. In case of virus, there are certain PAMs, 
also known as pathogen associated matter. When they come and attack, uh, attach to the host, these PAMPs are recognized by pattern recognition receptors. Okay, they are recognized the body's defense mechanism. Am I audible? Am I audible? Am I audible, Dr. Dipandu? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Voice. Okay. Oh, okay. Audible, ma'am, you are audible. You can continue with the session. Okay, actually, okay. though, screen showing that there is breaking of signal. So I thought maybe. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, no, no. it's going well, ma'am. Okay. So now the this uh, increase in WBC count. Okay, I told you there will be certain, uh, you know, pattern recognition receptors. Now, whenever there is a mechanism, you know, the body, the body's defense mechanism, you know, it is activated. Now, this defense mechanism of the body, which is activated, it will try to produce an antiviral immune response because the virus is attacking it. So once this antiviral immune response, you know, what is the antiviral immune response? It will start producing a lot of interferons. This interferons, these interfer interferons are a protective, uh, you know, protective to protect, uh, providing protection to the body. But see, here, there is a condition, you know, it is like a, what you, but you know, what I should, uh, what should I say? It is like a tug of war between the host and the virus, you know, the, uh, there are many factors which come into play that uh, the immune response, the genetic receptors, the genetic ability of the animal to uh, bear the viremia or the virus load. But once this tug of war starts, the virus keeps on modifying itself and it is continuously replicating using the host mechanism, host machinery, host ingredients, and the body is trying to protect itself by producing interferons or antiviral agents against that virus. Now, whichever wins leads to manifestation of disease. If the virus is able to overpower the cascading reaction which has it, is, it has initiated, that will lead to disease. And if the host is able to, you know, produce significant amount of uh, interferons and is able to combat the viremia, then the disease will not be manifesting itself in a, a very, uh, you know, uh, in a very uh, virulent form. Now, once this has been done, the viremia has been, you know, uh, started in the body, it leads to keratinocytosis, myocytosis, fibrocytosis and endothelial uh, damage. You know, the all these keratinocytes, myocytes and fibrocytes, these are all all kinds of cells which are found in the skin. And this, their effect on the skin is the reason why there are vesicles or there is vesiculitis or edema, infiltration of inflammatory cells at the skin region. Okay, or skin nodule formation. So the whole skin nodule formation in this viral disease is because of this. Now, clinical signs, the incubation period of this disease, I told you it is uh, two to five days. Okay, now in apparent, there is severe infection. Young calves are most uh, susceptible. There is nodule uh, development. There is decreased milk yield the main ones, okay? Now, there are certain raised, circular, firm, collapsing nodules. And these nodules are very common in the head, neck, upper, other perineum region. There are vesicles, erosions, which develop in the nasal area. There is rhinitis, there is conjunct conjunctivitis, excessive salivation. This excessive salivation, you know, whenever there is uh, in, uh, kind of vesicles or pustules or any kind of uh, you know um, uh, nodules formed in the uh, in the oral region that leads to excessive saliva formation. Okay, 
so all these are always affecting the animals and you know these pastu these uh, virus is very stable virus once this desiccated skin crust this virus is able to survive for 35 days in all these dead necrotizing nodules it is able to survive for 33 days in and you know in dead animals air dried hide this is able to survive for 18 days so this anim this virus is very resistant okay and is present for a longer time so the you know uh, the uh, these animals which are infected are kind of incubators for passing the infection to other animals okay one very common feature what we found something was lameness you know lameness because these pustules were very much uh, in the region area and because the animal was continuously licking that it led to um, uh, severe lameness in animals okay there were severe cases of lameness the animals were not able to stand also so now post mortem lesions were you know there were nodules and uh, you know mucous membranes lesions they were found in whole throat the git and there were nodules on lungs hemorrhages and spleen liver human the whole of the viscera was affected these were correct to see the skin nodule kind of thing was found in throughout the viscera and the animal uh, whichever animal died there was a sure shot thing that the whole of the git whole of the viscera was affected or had the presence of these now diagnosis of this disease do we have uh, we have time it will take 10 15 minutes more okay these uh, diagnosis so a field diagnosis the field diagnosis very rapid diagnosis which is based on the pustules but this diagnosis is not a confirmatory diagnosis you know the diagnosis which is uh, you know based on uh, vision that is presence of scabs or uh, where you can say the lumps uh, is very tentative it has to be you know these scabs and crust they have to be collected sent and transported to the lab where they will be confirmed that it is a uh, lumpy or something else you know the clinical diagnosis based uh, particularly or typically on skin nodules whereas in laboratory diagnosis the virus is isolated it is identified electron microscopy and along with the combination the history of the animal and then serologically the certain tests are conveyed and uh, we done and then we confirm that this is a lst virus okay now the economic loss of this economic loss is very huge there is damaged hides loss of uh, you know uh, the animal this uh, you know uh, loss of ability of the animal to work there are trade restriction because uh, people of area, uh, other areas or people of other countries do not uh, Uh, import animals which have uh, recent uh, uh, you know exposure of lumpy you know certain amount of a huge amount of money goes to cost of prevention and control of this disease decrease in milk pro uh, milk production decrease in fertility decrease in overall ability of the you know growth or what you call it decrease in the well being of the animal the emaciation the muscle condition is reduced and the cost of veterinary treatment and above all this the loss of the animal so all this accounts to a huge economic loss to the farmer to the economy to the state to the country in a stepwise position now prevention of this disease it's very very important that this disease be prevented and controlled okay even the treatment part i would say prevention and control is more important okay now before this uh, disease is reported this disease should uh, you know when uh, there is a doubt that there is lst outbreak the collection of sample and the information to the proper authorities it is very important the sample collection uh, should be done and should be sent to authorized laboratories only 
so as to prevent so that so as to confirm the disease and add so as to prevent further infection of the disease okay now first immediately this disease disease should be sent to the notifying authorities and the area of the you know the area who's uh, the veterinarian who's the area in charge should be um, you know uh, informed about this at uh, uh, at a you know district level then state level and the animal which has been diagnosed or which has been you know um, uh, doubted us as it has uh, lst should be quarantined now after the you know suspect uh, the suspected animal has been quarantined the area should be disinfected and this virus is susceptible to ether 20% chloroform formalin 1% certain detergents phenol 2% for 15 minutes so this any of these any of this disinfectant can be used and the area should be thoroughly disinfected even the surrounding troughs the feed managers the uh, water troughs they all should be disinfected mm, the floor should be washed so that the virus you know it's not uh, the, if the virus has been shed it should be cleared and the other animals are not affected by this now eradication of this should be through two main measures in endemic areas by vaccinating the cattle and uh, controlling the insects whereas in non endemic areas the animal should be kept in uh, you know free imports of certain you know animals should not be imported from areas where there it is where it is endemic the animals which are imported should be quarantined and proper carcass disposal should be there there should be cleaning and this, these are general eradication measures okay no effective treatment for lst all the animals who which have suffered lst there is only symptomatic treatment anti inflammatory painkillers antibacterials for secondary bacterial infection okay and vaccination they are only helpful if full protection and they only provide protection of within 3 weeks so if cattle should be vaccinated before the herd is infected okay infected animals need not be vaccinated okay in very rare or uh, uh, you know um, minor cases there will be any sign shown by you know vaccination the animal may show some uh, certain swelling at the site of vaccination or certain uh, other side effects but otherwise vaccination should be done of the healthy animals in case of pustules and uh, disease oral medication methylene blue has been found to be highly effective this kind of treatment or this treatment has been particularly you know uh, we have done this we have uh, uh, use the treatment in our uh, area and it has been found to be highly affected methylene blue oral medication at a rate of 0.1% 1 gram in 1 liter of water this was found very uh, effective ivermectin you know ivermectin at a rate of 0.2 mg per kg 3 shots at uh, 10 days interval now this ivermectin it is not related to you know uh it is it's, it it prevents you know ticks mites and my uh, you know all orthopod uh, population so animals safe from biting orthopods so it transmission of disease is stopped topical spray in case of adult animals methylene blue 300 ml of uh, methylene blue can be sprayed topically at 8 hours interval for 4 days that was also found to be effective treatment against lst not against lst once lst has developed symptomatic treatment against uh, for lst now strategy is to control lst first and most important strategy to control lst is restriction of movement strict strict restriction on animal movement should be placed okay second is vector control vector control should be adopted considering that vector is active during morning and evening hours we know that so the animal should be highly protected or there should be certain measures so that the area where the animals are placed that are controlled from these vectors during the early morning and the uh, evening hours 
mass awareness very important you know preventive strategies for disease management should be corrected at uh, you know should be done at all levels you know it is very important to educate uh, you know livestock owners and that could be done uh, through you know you you can uh, uh, organize programs we personally did it organizing pro programs uh, at uh, you know primary level schools or local hospitals so that you know even the district magistrate came into um, uh, you know uh, joint hands so that people are aware about how to control the disease animal isolation once the animal has been found affected the animal should be isolated stray animals also need to be isolated with the help of you know urban local bodies so that municipal corporation municipal committees and municipal councils they can help and uh, you know the stray animals are controlled then managemental practice it is very important that if one animal in your herd has been found affected there is thorough there are 100% chances that the secretions of that infected animal will be found in the um, in the you know feeding and watering troughs so common feeding and watering troughs of the affected animal and healthy animal should be avoided so isolated animal should be provided feeding and watering trough in a different um, uh, different feeding and watering trough in comparison to the healthy animal strategy for vaccination now vaccination in general we all know vaccination store vaccination should need to be stored properly they have to be you know or any kind of vaccination vial which is opened it should be utilized within 6 hours it should be maintained at refrigeration temperature the vaccination when it is the vaccine which is when it is uh, transported it should be uh, you know brought at a advisable temperature 4 to 8 degree centigrade okay vaccination are you know vaccine which is done is of two types the homologous vaccine and the heterologous vaccine now you know the homologous vaccine in which you know the lst uh, virus is passaged for 60 times in a lamb kidney cell and then it is uh, given to the animal and it provides immunity for about 3 year 3 years now the heterologous vaccine is you know the sheepox vaccine which is not the similar vaccine and it is uh, the sheep herpes uh, the sheepox virus it is passaged 18 times in the lamb testes or calf muscle cell and then it is given to the animal now this homologous vaccine that is lumpy pyovac this was uh, recently discovered by nrcer nrce pisar it is a ranchi strain 1 ml was given subcut and it is found highly effective there is the heterologous vaccine which is i so told you goat pox vaccine the uttarakashi strain it is also was given 1 ml subcut and was found to be effective very important thing that is vaccine priority at areas at blocks villages at uh, you know district level it is very very important that the nf unaffected animal should be vaccinated on priority basis because vaccinate uh, affected animals need not be vaccinated the vaccinated animals need not be vaccinated the unaffected animals which have not have had an exposure to lumpy need to be vaccinated first now treatment strategies if there is mild infection few skin nodules no fever i told you that is variable according to the animal analgesics preferably oral with the cerasopeptidase should be given moderate to severe inf infection skin nodules uh, fever swelling of limbs enlargement of lymph nodes antibiotics analgesics injection of vitamin c b complex and liver tonics need to be given if a wound develops the uh, they have to be cleaned regularly with betadine and apply on appointment for if the fever persists they need to uh, you know blood hematology needs to be done and checked for protozoan and recurrential infection too and even in during severe respiratory symptoms given antibiotic to control this 
So the treatment strategies can only be symptomatic and be called, followed by life. Okay. Now, in that the economic impact of this disease was there is severe emaciation. There is severe loss of milk production. The animal, the livestock owners fear that the animal is of no worth. Okay. There is secondary mastitis. The udder is affected because of pustules. The, uh, there are certain, uh, in certain cases, abortion was also found. Loss of fertility, delayed onset, uh, delay onset of estrus, extensive damage to the hide. The skin, there were marks which did not disappear. And there was, I told you, very common problem what we encountered is lameness. There was weakness, loss of draft abilities of the animals. So in general, this lumpy had a severe impact. But as I so told you, it is very seasonal. And now as it has been seen that the disease cases have been decreased dramatically. And as a virus was effective in causing huge losses, but uh, to grace of God, uh, the vaccination, vaccinations which were developed were found to be effective and uh, were able to control the disease in certain extent. Thank you. That was all in my pres uh, presentation.